Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. It's greater than information. It's greater than inspiration. It's greater than affirmation. Revelation comes from God. And my first point tonight is that revelation comes from God. We're going to start in the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And revelation teaching comes from God. In verse 13 of Matthew 16, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elisha, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, or has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, Jesus asked a simple question. He's like, Who do people say that I am? But you know, when people ask, Well, who's Jesus? You ask on television, or you ask in the media, or ask in the nations, and everybody has an opinion. Everybody has an opinion. Well, he's, you know, he's a prophet. Well, he's a good person. He's, uh, you know, he's a miracle worker. You know, he's this, he's that. And everybody has an opinion about everything in this world. Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus makes a statement. He said, that did not come from man. That is revelation. That is something that no human being can reveal. That is something my father showed you. You see, revelation cuts through all the opinions. Revelation goes to the heart of truth. And it reveals it. And you cannot get it unless God gives it to you. Revelation comes from God. It's an inspiration. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And, it, and, it, and it, it, it settles all the issues. Jesus says to Peter, flesh and blood did not show that, show that to you. My Father showed it to you. And I'm, my heart is passionate about how do we get revelation? And how does revelation come to us? Because I believe every one of us needs to have a greater hunger for revelation understanding. Amen? Amen. So revelation comes from God. You must, be, you must pray for it and ask for it because if it's coming from God, when you open up your Bible, you must be praying, God, give me revelation. Open my eyes so I can see this. I want not just what some opinion says. I want what you say. I want a revelation from the Holy Spirit. And point number two is that revelation teaching involves knowledge and understanding. There is an element of knowledge and understanding in Revelation. You understand how something works. And this is a very, very important point, so let me take a few minutes on it. Pastor Jim shared a, a story that I had told him a number of years ago about the great escape artist Houdini. Houdini was, you know, he was a magician actually originally, and then he became an escape artist, probably the most famous escape artist that's, you know, that, that is known in modern times. Houdini could escape from anything. I mean, they could put every handcuff. He was also a locksmith, and he understood, he understood every kind of lock, every type of handcuff, every type of jail cell. He understood, and he was able to actually swallow keys and ingest them and then spit them up and be able to use them to unlock things. And the, 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 the escape feats that he did were absolutely extraordinary. Just do a... Do a Google search on Houdini. He was able to escape from every single thing that they ever put him in. Every cell, they used to actually strip him naked and put him in a jail cell. And, you know, they would strip him naked so that he wouldn't have anything to, to use. And he would escape. He was only as not able to escape from one cell. They put him in a jail cell in southern Italy. He worked for about two or three hours and he tried everything he knew how. Every trick, everything that he had ever learned about locks and about cells, he tried and he finally gave up. 
and said, I've been able to escape from every cell except this one. The reason he could not escape from that one cell is was because the door was already open. It was never locked. He wasn't, he wasn't in a cell. He was only in prison in his mind. And as one moment he got knowledge, he just pushed the door open. Many times we are in prison spiritually because we don't have knowledge. Because we don't understand. We don't have a revelation. And the Apostle Paul prays this prayer for the believers. He says in Ephesians 1 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, praying for the saints, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. He prays for not just, you know, a revelation, but revelation in the knowledge of God. There is a knowledge component to revelation that we need to respect and understand. Now that revelation does come through study. It comes through learning. It comes through applying yourself to wisdom, applying yourself to understand, to seek God and say, God, I need to understand this. I need to learn. I need to get a revelation, God, because I don't understand whatever uh, you know, issue it is in life. Every single area of life has got a key. It's got a secret. There are mysteries. There are understandings. There's wisdom. If we understood those things, we would walk in a divine place in those areas. But we have to gain an, a passion and a heart for revelation. And we must have a heart to understand and a heart to learn. The apostle or the, the prophet Daniel in Daniel 9, he writes these words. And Daniel's now, a, he's a, um, one of the refugees of the children of Israel. He's in Babylon. He's been there for his whole life in Babylon since he was a small child taken to Babylon. He's in the palace of the king Nebuchadnezzar and he's seeking God. Lord, how long are we going to be here? God says, you go and study the Bible. And he begins to read the prophetic utterances of the past. And he, he starts seeking God. God, how long? God doesn't give him a, a, a number or, an, or a time. God says, go to the scriptures. And he starts reading Jeremiah's prophecies. This is what, Jer what Daniel writes in Daniel 9 verse 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. He said he, he understood by the books, he understood by reading, he understood by studying that God had determined there would be 70 years. So there is a, an understanding and a wisdom that comes from learning. That's why the passion of our heart is to put training schools because we've got to bring understanding. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. People die because they don't know how to deliver a baby. They die because they don't know how to take care of their, their teeth. They die because they don't know how to build a latrine that doesn't pollute their water supply. We've got to bring knowledge and we've got to bring understanding and wisdom to the nations. Amen? Yeah. Many people ask how we got the ISOM and I, didn't, I never had an angel visit me and say, oh, here's the ice I'm doing. I studied for year upon year upon year, and I was all the time seeking God, what's the key to this harvest? And finally God showed me, turn every church in the world into a training center. Bring revelation teaching into every local church. Take the greatest teachers in the world and bring their revelation into the local church, and every believer has the ability to grow in revelation understanding. That's what we do all over the world. 15,000 training sites now are using the curriculum. Now sometimes understanding undergirds the, what we do in life. If you understand the stock market or understand derivatives or understand, you know, all these different things, I don't understand them. So, you know, maybe you do. But when people who do understand these areas are able to do things in those areas that other people can't do. Amen? Amen? Now, in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus comes to a centurion. In verse 5, he says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, my, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. 
Now, the centurion says, Jesus, I've got this, this servant who's dreadfully tormented. Jesus says to him, I'm, I'm, I'll come and heal him. I mean, he's, he's got the green light. He's, Jesus will come right there and, and heal him. But the centurion goes on and he says, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And another one, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Jesus just spoke a word. The servant was healed. Now, my question to you is, was it faith or was it an understanding and a revelation of authority? You see, the centurion had a revelation of the authority of what Jesus had. He saw his own authority and he saw what he could do. And he saw Jesus' authority and had a revelation of who he was. That Jesus could just speak a word and no matter what he said, it was going to happen. He had a revelation of the authority of Jesus and so faith became easy. You see, when you have a revelation, understanding of how something works, you can speak and it will happen. Are you with me, church? We have to seek revelation. Lisa's pastor, many years ago, I remember him sharing a story of a, a guy who, it's actually a, a city in Canada, I think it was back in the 50s, where, you know, electricity was, was, was not as efficient as maybe it is today. And a, and a small town in a, a remote area, they had purchased a huge generator. And this generator had worked for many years, but it was getting old and it finally packed up and it, was, and it was on its last legs. And they realized they had to get a new generator for the city. They researched all the different companies and they finally found a company here in California. And they purchased this generator and it was taken up and it was installed in their city in Canada worked beautifully for about three years. But one morning when they woke up, they heard it making a terrible noise, and suddenly, it suddenly just seized and stopped. Well, they brought in all the electricians and the, the technicians and the electrical engineers and all the people that they had, anybody who knew anything about generators or about electricity. And these guys worked for about two or three hours. They could not get that machine to work. Finally, they realized, they said, we need to get this thing fixed before nightfall. They put an emergency call into the company here in California, and they actually paid for a charter flight to fly a technician from California to where they were in Canada. Flew this guy in. He arrived late in the afternoon, and he came into the large room where they had this generator. All of the technicians stood behind him watching, what's this great guy from California? What's he going to do that we haven't tried and haven't, be, haven't been able to do? And this man started on one side of the machine and he just went through, systematically just checking things and going all the way through this machine. He got to the other end. He turned around and he said to them, bring me a screwdriver, a large one. So they ran and bought him a large screwdriver and he flipped the, the screwdriver around, held it by the metal part, and he walked up to the machine, he stepped back, and he hit the machine. <laughs> he told them, he said, now turn it on. They went on, they turned the switch, and the, the, the machine roared to life, and it worked perfectly. The man turned around and flew back to California. They paid all the expenses, but two weeks later, the bill arrived from California. They only had one line. For fixing your generator, $5,010. They're like, this is crazy. The guy was only there for 10 minutes. You know what? He, he, he went through our machine and took a screwdriver, hit, it on, hit the machine, and then walked away. And 5000 they said, they sent a letter back, a pretty angry one. They said, we demand an itemized breakdown of your bill. Two weeks later, second bill arrives. It has two lines. First line, it says $10 for hitting your generator with a screwdriver. <laughs> the second line says $5,000 for 
for knowing where to hit the generator with the screwdriver. <laughs> when you understand things, they're worth something. Amen? Amen? And what my heart is tonight is to impart to all of us a passion to understand, a passion to grow in revelation. You may think, well, I have a revelation of Jesus. Well, that's not enough. You need a revelation in prayer. You need a revelation in God's healing power. You need a, a revelation in your marriage. You need a revelation in giving. You need a revelation in your family. You need a revelation in prosperity. You need a revelation in the prophetic ministry. You need a revelation in raising your children. You need a revelation in your friendships and in your relationships. You need a revelation in your intimacy with God, in your love and your forgiveness, in all the other areas of life. And we need to have a hunger. That's why the church has been saying to everybody that comes here and gives their life to Christ, give us a year. A year is just the beginning. A year will just give you a taste of how your life will change if you will pursue God and pursue revelation, pursue understanding. Are you with me, church? Amen? Amen. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I never really understood this scripture before, and let me tell you, don't ever worry. None of us are even close to this, so don't have to worry about the Apostle Paul's problem here. He says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan to buffer me, lest I be exalted among measure. What the Apostle Paul was saying was that the reason why God actually sent something to humble him was because he had so many revelations. He was so passionate and so desired to learn about the heavenly realm, to learn about his faith in God and to learn about the things of God. He was so passionate about that that he had gained such a level of knowledge and understanding and wisdom that the Lord had to keep him humble. Because the Bible says knowledge can puff you up. And God will make sure that whatever we do, that he keeps us in a place where we're dependent upon him. Amen? Amen. Amen. But the point is, he wasn't talking about one revelation. Some Christians, they're just happy because they had a revelation of Jesus. Well, that's great. That's just the start. You're not, you're not at this point where you have an abundance of revelations. God wants us to have a hunger for the revelation of heaven. Amen? Now, when I put this one up, we need much revelation teaching. Nobody has it all. Because so many times, people gravitate to one teacher or another. Oh, this guy, oh, he's just the greatest. You know, he's the most amazing person in the world. And, you know, I just everything that he teaches is just God. Let me tell you, after being around some of the greatest teachers and leaders in the entire global church, Lisa and I work for Reinhard Bonker, it's, I mean, we have been around the best. Nobody has all the answers. We need the global church. We need God's people. We need the uh, uh, revelations that God's given to the global body. And a person can have a great revelation. You know, I studied the life of Dr. John G. Lake. Many of you may not have even heard of him, but he started a major movement, a denomination in southern Africa. He was here in California, up in Spokane, Washington. He had over 100,000 documented miracle healings in Spokane, Washington in a five-year period. The Department of Health, I believe, declared that city the healthiest city in the, in the entire country. I mean, he had incredible healing miracles. He went to Africa and, and he started this incredible movement and started thousands of churches have come out of his movement that are in the country where I was born. But you know what, as great as his revelation was on healing, his first wife died. She died of hunger because he didn't have a revelation on how to take care of his, of his family. He didn't have a revelation on God's provision. She was feeding all the people that were coming day and night and she didn't eat herself. And they didn't have enough food in the house and she died of starvation. 
His first two children, I understand, turned away from God because he didn't have a revelation of how to raise his children. Even though he had this great revelation and healing, he did not have these other revelations. My understanding is that he, he married again and his second wife and his second children that he had, they served God because he learned to grow in those areas that he didn't have revelation in. And we all need to recognize we've all got blind spots. And that's my fourth point. We need revelation in our blind spots. Now, we started with Matthew 16. Remember Jesus and Peter? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember that amazing scripture? Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't show you. Peter, you just had a revelation from God. I mean, you think Peter's, he's, he's walking on water. He did for a short time, then he sank. But you know, Peter had a revelation from God about who Jesus was. Now, you can go and count five, I think it's maybe six verses later. We pick it up in Matthew 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. From 17 to 23, six verses after Jesus says to Peter, flesh and blood didn't show this to you. My father showed this to you. Six verses later, he says, get behind me, Satan. The same guy. The same Peter. That means that he spoke under the revelation of God concerning who Jesus was. But he did not have a revelation of what Jesus was supposed to do. And so some people say, oh, this person has such a revelation. You know, God used them to give me a word of knowledge or God used them to show them. And people will take because a person has a revelation in one area and they'll say, well, he must have a revelation in everything. That's just not true. You've got to learn to discern where true revelation is. And some people walk in a supernatural revelation in one area of their life, but they do not have revelation in another area. And that's why we as believers need to recognize our blind spots. We need to realize that the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the church. He says, you're doing this and this and this, great. But you know what? I have a few things against you. These, these areas here, you need to fix them. I often want Jesus to say to our church, say, God, show us all the good things we're doing. We're feeding the poor. We're doing this. But Lord, where are our blind spots? What are the things we should be doing that we're not doing? And then when he speaks to us individually and personally, I know I've got blind spots. I know there's areas that I don't get walk in revelation. But I want to be at least cognizant and understand that they're there so I don't try and be the authority on everything. Amen? Amen? If you have a revelation, walk in that revelation, but don't try and be the authority over an area that you don't have a revelation in. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen? Amen. David prays and says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. No, this is in Psalm 139. It should come up on the, on the overheads. This is David praying to God, and he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a tough prayer. Because you're asking the Father, search me. See if there's any wicked way in me. And Lord, I want to understand it. I want to know my faults. I want to know my weaknesses. I want to know where I'm going wrong. You don't want to just keep going into destruction. You want to find the right way. You want to find the way of light, of understanding, of truth, and of revelation. But you have to be willing to be transparent. Say, God, you know what? I'm great in this area, but I really need some help here. Are you with me, church? Yeah. Last point. Revelation is carried and released by people. You know, if you don't have a revelation... You can't give a revelation. 
If you've not come to a place of understanding, you've not come to a place of wisdom, you've not come to a place of God illuminating something to you, you're going to be in the place of opinion. Well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Well, these people say this, those people say that. Until God cuts through all of that and gives you an understanding, you're going to be, you know, vacillating. And you've got to realize that there are people that carry revelations. The, the core essence of our entire ministry is to look around the world and find revelation. And to try and, I will travel to the ends of the earth. We've gone all the way to the Philippines, to Australia. We've gone to other nations, to other parts of this nation uh, here in the United States. We've traveled to the ends of this country and the world. I'm after one thing. I'm after a revelation understanding. When I find somebody who's had a revelation, we've got some of the teachings back there. And, you know, when Cheryl Salem lost a five-year-old and she's caught up into the heavenlies after she lost her child. And she had cancer and was dying. And you know what? She didn't understand what had happened to her. But Jesus took her out of her body up into the presence of Jesus himself. And she had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And Jesus spoke to her. And she brought forth some understandings of, of, of death and the afterlife that, you know, are just amazing. They're just total revelation. The Lord said, your daughter's no longer in your past. She's in your future. Look forward, you're going to see her again. Start looking to the end of the race that God has for your life. I have one there called Conquering the Sin Nature. It's very personal to me because for 13 years I struggled with my thoughts. And I would be worshipping God and an ungodly thought would come in my mind. I would try to cast it down, bind the devil. I would throw scripture at it. The more I tried not to think about it, the more I thought about it. Then the devil sat on my shoulder and said, doesn't Jesus say if you even think about it, you've committed it. Now I was under guilt, condemnation. I was, you know, the blood of Jesus. But you know what? The devil had a field day. And it wasn't just one day, three days a week. It was 13 years of struggle until God gave me revelation. You see, the Bible says the anointing will break the yoke, but only truth will make you free. God showed me that the sin nature in me in God's eyes is not me. I was fighting the flesh with the flesh. When he showed me that the sin nature that I was fighting was not the real me. The real me was the person who loved God and wanted to serve him. But I was trying, believing the lie of the devil that the sin nature in me was me. And God broke that chain. I don't have those problems anymore. And when I release that in that teaching, it sets other people free because they're in the same place. They're in the prison cell and they don't know that the door's already open. Amen? Yeah. Revelation is carried by people. Second Kings chapter 6. And we're almost done here. This is a story of Elisha. Surrounded by armies. And in verse 15 we'll pick up the story. When the servant of the man of God arose early and went outside, or went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So Elisha and his servant are sleeping in a, in a city. They wake up in the morning. The king of Syria has sent just a massive army to come and capture him and take them prisoner and probably kill them. And so they wake up in the morning and the servant looks out and he just sees just soldiers. He sees a massive army and he says to Elisha, Alas, my father, what shall we do? Are you with me in the story? Alas, my master, what shall we do? So in verse 16, so he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Wait. It's Elisha and his servant. And there's an entire army. And the servant's looking at Elisha like, you are still dreaming. But now look what happens. So he answered, do not fear those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. He saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. 
the man of God who had revelation, he could see those armies. He could see them around. The servant could not see them. The man of God laid hands and said, open his eyes, God, so he can see the protection of heaven. You need a revelation of God's protection around your home, around your business, around your family, around your church. God's got armies of fire, of chariots. There's more on our side than on their side and on the enemy side. And when you get a revelation of God's protection, you won't fear. No matter what the opposition is, God is on your side. Amen? Amen. You see, a person who has a revelation can give revelation. Peter and John going to the temple, they see a man begging, asking for money, and they say, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have, we give. See, they had a revelation of healing. They said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And that man jumped up, and he was healed. Because they had a revelation of healing. There's a revelation of healing. There's a revelation of protection. There's a revelation in all these areas. We just have to pursue it. Amen? Amen. We're entering now, to me, one of the most amazing campaigns. I want to speak faith into the heart of this church. There is a revelation of giving. There is a supernatural. Let me tell you, I have met people who walk in a supernatural place of giving and provision. We as a ministry, in 21 years, we've never missed a payroll, never not paid a bill on time. Because we walk as a ministry in a supernatural place of God's provision. I learned a lot of it from Reinhardt, but God also supernaturally began to bring it into my own life. And I had to step on those waters. And sometimes when you start stepping on those waters, it's a, it's a ginger step. <laughs> Reinhardt had a huge fire conference in Europe, in England, in 1988. He invited different speakers from all over the world. Very famous teachers came in. He invited a sort of an interesting guy from Mexico, he was a missionary in Mexico City. His name was Wayne Myers. Wayne is a very interesting character. I mean, this guy drives a beat up station wagon and just gives millions and millions away. He goes to Christ for the Nations. He's from that school there in Dallas, Texas, and he'll, he'll go there and he'll just stand at the gate and watch the students come by from different nations. And he'll say, the Lord will say, okay, take that one, that one, that one, that one. And he says, he'll pull them to himself and he'll say, I'm going to pay all your tuition, all your books, everything. He doesn't have it. But he just, he has a message called living to give. So when we recorded the ISOM, I looked around, God, who can teach on giving? And God brought my mind, Wayne Myers. I've, we brought him up from Mexico City and he came to where we were doing the recording back at, in, at, in Cottonwood Christian Center in, in, uh, in Los Alamitos. And Wayne came in and, you know, five hours I recorded him. I was directing cameras, like what Luke used to do back there. And five hours I'm recording this man teaching on giving. I really can't even remember hardly a scripture that he said. I remember something about God preparing a table in the wilderness. I don't even hardly remember almost anything that he taught. But I'll tell you what I do remember. For five hours, I looked at a face that shone like the sun. This man exuded more joy than I have ever seen in any human being. And for five hours, I'm looking at this guy's face because I'm have to direct the cameras. I have to go from this angle, that angle, that angle. And I'm watching for five hours a joy that I've never, ever seen. And I finally, at the end of the five hours, I turned to the guy in the control room. I said, you know what? If it's that much fun to give, Lord, teach me to give. Amen. There's a joy in giving. And I was challenged because this guy was challenging me to step into a supernatural place of giving and of living in a place of supernatural provision. And I began to say, God, I want, I want that revelation. Now, before we left Reinhardt, we were in Germany, and there was a guy from England called Grant Gill. 
he was visiting over from England and, you know, we were getting rid of all of our stuff. I think we gave him some of our, our things that we had in our apartment because we couldn't take them back to America. And this guy went and started a church in London. Grant Gill drove Wayne Myers for a week around England. Now let me tell you, Revelation is infectious. Because when you see somebody walk in it, you're like, man, I would be nice to walk in that. I'd love to be able to do what that person's doing or understand like they do. My friend Grant Gill, for a whole week, had to drive him around, hear story after story of him putting roofs on buildings, giving cars away to pastors, giving, I mean, giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And they're never running out. My friend Grant Gill was really, really challenged. And he said, God, you know, I've never given a car away to a pastor. I've never done something like that. So he started to save up his money because he thought, when I next go to Africa, I am going to save up enough money and I'm going to give my first car to a pastor. Well, he went, after he had saved up his money, he went to South Africa and he was looking for a car to give to a pastor. Well, as he was driving along the road, he saw a big sign saying, car auction today. And he felt the Holy Spirit say, go in right over here. Well, it was at a car auction with 11 cars. And it was a silent auction, so they put the car windows down just a little bit. And you wrote out your bid, put it in the car window, and then at the end of the day, they counted up all the bids, and whoever had the highest bid won the car. So Grant looked for the nicest looking car and he put a bit in there. He thought, well, what if I don't win that one? Well, I should put a few more in. So yeah, well, he ended up putting one in each car. But I think he was thinking British pounds and they were thinking African rands, all right? Because when they opened up the bids, he won all 11. <laughs> all 11. But he only had enough money for one. He went into a cold sweat. He said, God, I, I just need to get away. I need to pray. What am I supposed to do now? I was trying to, I was trying to step on this area of, of, of revelation giving, and now I'm in a mess. I'm, gonna, I'm ruining my credit, and you know, you know, now I'm going to be embarrassed, and I can't pay. So he asks the auctioneer, can I please choose the best car, and I want to take it on a test drive. He just wanted to get away and pray. <laughs> he chose a green Ford Sierra, the nicest one that they had there, and he took the keys, they took, gave him his own keys of his own car, and he started driving off, and he's sweating before God, praying, oh God, what am I going to do now? I don't like this revelation stuff, I don't like stepping on these waters. And as he's driving down the road, he sees a big sign that says, Ford dealership, we buy used cars for cash. The Holy Spirit says, go in there. He takes the green Ford Sierra, and he says to the guy who's purchasing, he says, well, how much would you give me? The man gives him enough money to pay for all 11 cars. Amen. He gave 10 cars away. 10. Now, when I, I wrote this in my book, Abraham Promise, and I, I wanted to check the story, and I got his email address from Wayne Myers, and I sent an email. I said, Grant, this is the best I understand the story. I need you to check it. He fixed a few things, and he said, no, this, this, this. And then he said, you haven't heard the end of the story. He says, I have now given away 30 cars, and I have number 31 in my garage waiting for God to tell me who to give it to. Amen. He started walking in revelation of giving. There is a revelation place. Let me tell you, we began a number of years ago when we started the Miracle Birthday Offering. My wife and I, we just were challenged. Okay, we're going to give the little extra. And we started giving and we stretched our faith. You know, from the day we went above and beyond the tithe, God turned our finances supernaturally around. When they finished the Miracle Birthday Offering and we finished our pledge, I told my wife, I'm not going to lose out on this blessing. We're keeping on going. And now we're just turning it now and we've gone up a whole nother notch because I know that when we start stepping into freedom for our future, that God is going to do something so supernatural. We're going to give away cars. We're going to give away houses. We're going to give away, I'll tell you, God will prosper us like you've never seen. Amen. 
And my passion tonight is to challenge you as a church and to challenge all of us to catch a heart for revelation. To say to God, Lord, teach me to walk in these places. Teach me to, to stretch my faith and to go into another level where I was too tentative. And let me tell you, sometimes putting your foot on those waters is not easy. I'm the first one to tell you, but let me tell you, the promises of God are the safest places you will ever stand. And in those places, God will take care of you. Do it with wisdom. Do it with prayer. Do it with revelation understanding. Seek God. How can I step into this place? Not just in giving, but in all the areas that God wants to grow your life in. All of us have those blind spots. All of us have those areas. But God can teach us to walk in revelation so we will overcome in Jesus' name. If you've got something tonight, give the Lord a hand. Amen. We don't have to say much more about our tithes and offerings, but if um, you have in your heart tonight, I'm just going to challenge you. This weekend is Freedom for Our Futures, where we bring our first fruits, our first pledges. I'm just going to challenge you to just believe God to do something supernatural. And so if you are watching us online and you want to be a part of giving, there's a giving button right there. If this is the church that you get fed from, just go ahead and uh, just make out, uh, just click on the button that says donate. And I do all my giving online. It's very hard for me to do it on all paper checks. But you know what? Whatever way God blesses you to give, I want you more to look at your heart and for you to uh, step into that supernatural place and believe God um, to be able to provide in a, in a way that you've never seen before in your life, in your family, in your business, in every area. Amen? We don't want to ever leave a service because there are people that came in here. God brought you in here today and you don't want to leave. It'll be a terrific shame if you came in here and you got something out of the message but you left here without making your life right between you and Jesus Christ. I'm praying that God today will give you that revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the Messiah. He is the only Savior. Jesus said, I am the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you came here tonight and you are away from God, maybe you backslidden, maybe a friend brought you, but you need to get right with God. And God has given you tonight just an understanding that He's real, that Jesus Christ is the answer. And you can come to a place where Jesus will come into your heart and He will, he will transform your inside. We saw the testimony of Raymond. Raymond was just a person who was in bondage to drugs and in bondage to sin of this world. And you may be in bondage. It doesn't make a difference what you're in bondage to. But the answer is Jesus. The only one who can break every chain. The only one who can set you free. The only one who can forgive every sin. And I felt that there was even somebody tonight who feels like what I've done, I, I cannot be forgiven for. And God wanted me to say to you, it can be forgiven. He will forgive you. He will, if you will only come, He will forgive your sin. There's nothing beyond His power to redeem and His blood to forgive. But you have to make a decision tonight to give your heart and your life and your soul into the hands of Jesus. You've got to open your life and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Change me on the inside. Do what you did in Raymond. Do it in my life. God will do it for you. If he did it for that man, he will do it surely for you. But every one of you have to face that. I don't want you to leave tonight and, oh, well, you know, well, it was a good service, but, you know, I was too embarrassed to make a decision myself. You only have a few certain times in life where the opportunity is given to you, where you can make a change, where you can turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. There's only a few times in life where it's that clear, where you can reach out and take a hold of it and take a hold of salvation. I'm going to count to three in a moment. And if you need to make your life right, if you have been backslidden, you need to come back to God. I'm asking you just to put everything, just cast everything aside 
And I want you today to raise your hand and that you will make a decision today and say, I want to come back to God or I want to make things right between me and God. We don't have much time, so on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And I'm saying who should raise their hand to those who, you know, are not sure that they're saved. They're not sure that if they died, they would go to heaven. Make sure today, those of you, you know, who know that you need a Savior, those of you who are backslidden and need to come back to Him, anyone who knows that they need the forgiveness of God here tonight, and maybe one day you serve God, but now you've walked away from Him, but you want to come back tonight, or tonight is your first time, you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. As we count to three, I just want you to raise up your hand. And by raising up your hand, you're saying, Lord, I, I don't just want Jesus in my head. I just want to know about him. I want to know him in my heart. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. Because we're going to pray here. I'm going to change destinies tonight. We don't have much time. So I'm on the count of three, if you need to raise your hand, you need to make your life right with God, I want you to get ready right now to raise it up. On the count of three, one, two, three. And three, raise up your hand if you need to make your life right between you and God. I see your hand there. I see a hand back there. Ushers, if you can help me here. All right, I see your hand. See two hands over here. Anybody else that needs it? I see a hand back here. Anybody else that needs it? I see a hand here, a hand here. I see a hand here. I see a hand back there. Is there anybody else that you need to make things right? I see your hand back there. God sees every hand that's raised. You can put it right down after I've acknowledged it. Anybody else that needs to make that decision? Tonight, you need to make your life right before God. You may not have another chance. I see another hand back there. God bless you. Anybody else? In the family rooms, anywhere else? I see another hand over there. God bless you. You can put it down. It's okay. Amen. Put your hands down. All of us, I want you to stand in the presence of God. And I'd like those people that raise their hand to do something that's going to take boldness, but I'm going to ask you tonight because we want to change destinies. I want you just to get a hold of your coat, sweater, your Bible, get a friend if you need a friend. I want you to step into the aisle as we ever give them a hand. If you can come and join me up front, I want to have the privilege of praying for you. If you want to make things right between you and God, just come forward now. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. You can come and change your destiny tonight. God bless you. Come forward. Give your heart to Jesus tonight. God bless you. God bless you, young man. God bless you. Anybody else that needs to make that decision? Don't wait. Don't wait. While the revelation's there, take advantage of it. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Thank you. I want everybody just to bow their heads. We're going to pray together. Everybody in the front, I want you to pray this from your heart. I'm, not, I'm going to give you the words, but it's from you to Jesus. It's not me. Just I, nothing, It's not being prayed to myself. It's being prayed to Jesus. And I'm going to give you the words, but I want you to put your heart behind it and your faith. I want you to pray this prayer. Everybody say, and everybody together with those up front, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You came to this earth. You died upon a cross for my sins and my salvation. Your blood was shed to forgive my past. I believe you rose from the dead and you're alive right now. You're here in this place. I invite you, Jesus, come into my heart. Change me on the inside. I give my future into your hands. Be my Lord and be my Savior from this day forward. Help me to serve you. Let my heart be changed. Let me be born again by your Holy Spirit. Do a miracle in my life. Right now, I receive you into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. I want you to look to your left, my right here, Pastor Joel. He's going to do, I've already prayed with you. He's going to give you some free literature and he's going to introduce you to a program we have at the church that will help you take the next step. So if you can turn to your left, follow Pastor Joel. Let's give him a hand as they go. God bless you. Amen.
Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.